Hello all, and welcome to this episode of Physical Attraction. I'm very excited to say that we have a special guest on the show today, Tom Kalina. Now, Tom Kalina has had a long and storied career in nuclear disarmament for many years, as now as the Director of Policy at the Plowshares Fund, a non-profit foundation dedicated to trying to prevent the spread and use of nuclear weapons. With former Secretary of Defence Bill Perry, he has just written a book called The Button, The New Nuclear Arms Race and Presidential Power from Truman to Trump. And this is a book about the past, present and future of nuclear weapons. It is an area, of course, that long-term listeners to the show will remember that we were very interested in the Tail Wauke series, the interviews with Martin Pfeiffer and Stephen Schwartz. It's, it's something that we've covered before on this show, and we're bringing it back today because of this excellent new book that's just been released. We had a fascinating discussion about the risks to all of us from current nuclear policies and how we can, in fact, easily act to reduce those risks. Without further ado, then... The interview. First of all, Tom, thanks very much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I want to start by asking this. You've had an incredible career in nuclear disarmament and arms control for several decades now. It seems clear to me that trying to do whatever one can to reduce the risk of a nuclear war is clearly a noble thing to do. But what made you decide that you wanted this to be your life's work? Was there a specific moment or memory that you have when you realized that this was what you wanted to to dedicate your time to? Uh, that's a great question, and and I'm I'm, I'm not sure there really was. I, I knew I wanted to get into this work uh, when I was in high school, and uh, just to date myself, you know, those were the Reagan years, and it was at the end of the Cold War uh, when people really thought we might get into a, a nuclear exchange, a nuclear war with the then Soviet Union, and so you know this was sort of the issue of the day um, as as climate change is now. Uh, or or other um, you know top hot button issues, and so I wanted to get involved. Um, I got involved in high school. I was involved in college in campus organizing, um, and I just kept doing it. And uh, you know, I kind I kind of figured that this would just be kind of a fun thing to do, and eventually I would get a real job. But um, uh, I just got lucky, and then I, I sort of went from one job to another. And I'm still doing it. So I, I can't say there was ever one point where I said, I'm going to dedicate my life to this. But uh, but that's just kind of how it turned out. And uh, it's worked out great. Yeah, it's interesting. The campus organization, I spoke to Stephen Swartz, who wrote the book uh, Atomic Audit about US nuclear weapons some, some years ago now. Sure. And he said that it was the campus organizing that got him into it as well. So c- coming on to The Button, which is this book that you've co-authored, it's out recently, with the former US Secretary of Defense, uh, Bill Perry, who was Secretary of Defense under Bill Clinton. Now, this book, it's, it's a fascinating mix of a, a warning about the dangers of nuclear weapons uh, the recent history of the efforts towards nuclear disarmament, much of which you've been involved with, and a call to arms for further action in the future. And one of the things that you highlight very early on, and that has become quite topical over the last few days, is that a lot of people have misconceptions about nuclear weapon systems and who actually has launch authority. And the book opens up with a kind of doomsday scenario where the consequences of how the system is set up at the moment become startlingly clear to the reader. Would you like to discuss that? Sure. Uh, you know, I think one of the, the main uh, ideas of the book is to educate people just how dangerous our current um, nuclear launch policies are and to remind people that even though the Cold War ended 30 years ago, uh, nuclear weapons haven't disappeared and the nuclear dangers haven't disappeared. And the main danger that we think is um, – under considered, underrepresented in the current uh, public discourse, is is the danger of blundering into nuclear war by mistake. Um, we really don't think there's there's. I mean, the good news is that we don't think there's much of a risk of an intentional nuclear war. We don't think either the United States or Russia is going to, in a premeditated way, launch a surprise attack against the other. Uh, for the simple reason that it would be national suicide. Uh, any nation that that launches that kind of attack is not going to wipe out the ability of the other country to retaliate. So a devastating nuclear strike will come back at you uh, and you will pay the price. So neither country has any incentive to launch a first strike. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're out of the woods because we have these very sophisticated, uh, very deadly weapons uh, poised to be launched at any 
minute because each side is worried about the possibility of a surprise attack. So we're kind of like a sprinter at the starting line waiting for the gun to go off. Uh, but the gun hasn't gone off for 75 years, yet we're still uh, there. We're still waiting for, for that for that shot to take off. And so as you see with, you know, with runners on the starting line, there's false starts all the time, right? They think the gun's about to go, so they jump. That's kind of where we are with nuclear weapons. And if one side jumps, it would be devastating uh, for not only the country on the receiving end of those weapons, but for the entire globe, um, because the effects of the weapons would be would be worldwide um, and would be devastating. So the scenario that we paint at the beginning of the book um, is kind of a bumbling into nuclear war scenario, where the president uh, is playing golf and he gets a phone call uh, saying that hundreds of nuclear weapons are are on the way. Um, alerts that have happened before, uh, by the way. And the president just has minutes to decide what to do before those weapons, if real, land and destroy all the land-based ballistic missiles. Because, of course, the United States has land-based missiles, submarine-based missiles, and uh, bomber, airplane-based nuclear weapons. Uh, But the most vulnerable ones are the land-based missiles. And if they're not launched... um, Immediately, if the attack is real, they will be destroyed. So the president is told, you know, sir, if you don't launch these weapons right away, they'll be destroyed in the ground, uh, and and that would, you know, set back our retaliation. Um, and so the president decides, um, under after some discussion with his advisors, uh, that he will launch. So the president orders the launch, which he does through the nuclear football that travels with the president at all times, which is essentially a uh, communications device and a menu of options for what launches he can he can order up. Uh, and he uses the football to call the war room in the Pentagon. Um, and he, he orders a, a, a full retaliatory strike, which, by the way, is, um, is within the rights of the president. The president has sole authority. Uh, the president can launch nuclear weapons first whether we know that it's a real attack or not. Uh, And so the weapons are launched. Um, The ICBMs take off. um, The submarine-based weapons take off. The bombers take off. um, The whole whole thing. And the president never has to consult um, with anyone if he doesn't want to. Uh, He can, but but he doesn't have to. And so, of course, in this case, it turns out that it's a false alarm, uh, which again have happened before. Uh, This false alarm is caused by a cyber attack, uh, which we know is possible because all of our nuclear weapons and our command and control systems are networked uh, and therefore are vulnerable to to cyber hacks. Um, But of course, once the president launches the nuclear weapons, they can't be recalled. Uh, None of our missiles, uh, the bombers can be recalled, but but none of the missiles, uh, none of the uh, ballistic missiles can be recalled after launch. So the president orders the weapons to be launched after about five minutes, says, what happened? Uh, He's told that it was a false alarm and there's nothing he can do. Um, And so this is, you know, not, this hasn't happened yet, (laughs) thankfully, but all of this could happen. These are all real policies. Uh, Nothing in here was, was made up in terms of the policy impacts or the policy uh, components of this. Uh, and the only thing that hasn't happened, uh, thankfully, is that none of it has come together to create this kind of catastrophe. But it could, and that's why we wrote this book, is to uh, is to try to wake up um, some public concern, because we can solve this tomorrow. Uh, this isn't like climate change that would take, you know, um, uh, decades to solve. Uh, nuclear policy can be solved tomorrow if we have the political will. To do it, this is not rocket science. So, uh, let's figure it out. Yes, I think it's such it's such a chilling, a sort of chillingly realistic thing that um, the the scenario is portrayed at the start. And I think again, I mean, there is this major misconception that you must run into all the time. In fact, you know, I read you did a Reddit Ask Me Anything yesterday, and the sort of top comment with people saying they were sort of in disbelief that this might be true that the president has sole launch authority. 
and they were sort of thinking, well, is there not some complicated process? Do they not check? Is there no uh, consultation that has to happen beforehand? But the, the protocol is that if the president orders it, uh, the order is, is carried out. And, you know, we, we can think of incidents from history. You mentioned one in your book, um, a, a depressed Richard Nixon at the height of Watergate is drinking heavily. And uh, his, his defense secretary, Schlesinger, supposedly quietly tells people, you know, I'm concerned about the president's mental stability. Um, if he orders a nuclear strike, don't obey. And we simply don't know, in my view, what would have happened if Nixon had, uh, you know, in a, in a sort of fit of drunken peak, ordered a strike. Now, in between scheduling this interview uh, and the interview actually happening, today is October the 8th, um, the, the president at the moment um, became ill with COVID-19, which we know can be fatal. He is on a steroid drug, dexamethasone, and people have speculated around how that may affect his mental state. You know, luckily, this stuff where the president's uh, incapacitated, I suppose, for a short period of time didn't happen in the midst of a nuclear standoff, or it could be even worse. Now, I know there's fans of Trump who might think this is hysterical, but then half of them also want to say that, you know, Biden is this guy who isn't mentally fit to be president, who takes his orders from radical communists and all this sort of thing. So I think there, there might be a universal point there that we don't really want to have anyone having this amount of sole power and authority without any checks on it. I mean, how have you been reacting to what you've seen lately? And do you think that there's maybe a, a teachable moment here? Uh, definitely. I mean, you, you mentioned the, um, the Reddit AMA that we did. Um, you know, we had over uh, 1,400 comments on that, um, a really rich discussion. Uh, way more concern about this issue than I uh, would have expected. Um, way more, and and I think it it comes down to the fact that look, there is one person, uh, just one person standing t- between us and nuclear devastation, and that person uh, has COVID and he's on heavy medications, which you pointed out could affect um, the clarity of his thinking. And we have to ask: this is the plan. Right. I mean, <laughs> we've, mm. we've, we have, we, this is our plan. We get to make this up. And this is the plan we've come up with is, is to leave the fate of the world uh, in the hands of one person um, whose, whose mental state is in question. Uh, yes, this is the plan, folks. Um, this is it. And, and so we have to ask why, you know, why is this the plan? And, and I think part of it is that, People don't want to believe that's the plan, and, and that's mm-hmm. that's what I heard coming through loud and clear in this Reddit AMA, is that people kept saying, "Really? Well, no. I mean, th- there's got to be um, either there's a way out of it, or 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 the risks are too great, and we don't have any choice." And, and so, so the 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 misperceptions fall into one of those two camps. So, specifically, people feel that. Well, yeah, there's risks here, but but the president has to be able to launch nuclear weapons quickly within minutes. So this is a risk we have to take. Um, and the other is that, well, okay, it's a risk, but the military brass will stop it if something untoward goes on. Um, so it's really not that much of a risk. Uh, both of those things um, are dangerous myths, and I'll, and I'll go into into each one. You know, the president doesn't have to launch quickly. I mean, I mean this this myth is born from the fact that it is true that if if the Soviet if if Russia were to try to attack the United States uh, with nuclear weapons, those weapons would be here uh, in 30 minutes or less. So a very time constrained situation. But let's um let's play that out. Uh, if there is an alarm uh, of an incoming attack, there's two possibilities. One it's a it's a false alarm or it's a real alarm and it's a real attack. Uh, if it's a false alarm, you've got two options. You can respond or you cannot respond. Uh, if you respond to a false alarm, well, you've just started nuclear war by mistake. Uh, and you've devastated the world, the end of civilization, full stop. So you shouldn't respond if it's a false alarm. Now, of course, you don't know <laughs> if it's false alarm or real uh, <laughs> yes. until the time runs out. So let's say it's a real attack. Okay, well, you can respond, but even a response doesn't stop that attack from coming, right? We don't have effective missile defenses, and us launching an offensive strike does not stop the possible attack coming in. Uh, and again, if it's and and so if you launch, you haven't stopped the attack. 
And if you don't launch, okay, so you've lost now, and the attack is real, you've launched, you've lost your land-based ballistic missiles. But you haven't lost your ability to respond because we still have at least the submarines that are deployed at sea. So you're no worse off than you were before. So in both scenarios, um, the the answer is don't launch. And because we assert in the book strongly and because we believe it, is that a president in that scenario would have to assume that it's a false alarm until proven otherwise. Uh, and why do we say that? Well, again, the Russians or anyone else has no incentive to launch a nuclear strike at the United States that would be suicidal for them. So if there is uh, an, an alert, our assumption is that it's a false alarm. Also in part, because we've had false alarms before, we've had at least three and the Russians have had at least two. And we think the likelihood of false alarms is going up uh, because of the possibility of cyber attacks, that our weapons and our communication systems are all networked. Uh, and it is just, uh, it, we can't say it's not possible. Um, so all, all the more reason that the president has to assume that any alert uh, is false until proven otherwise, uh, and therefore should not respond to an alarm. And therefore, there's no risk. I'm sorry, there's risk. There's no rush. So there's no rush to respond. The other, the other myth out there is that, okay, well, if the president makes a bad decision, uh, the military brass will, will bail him out. So here's the problem with that. There's two problems with that. One is that the president doesn't have to get the input of anybody. Uh, the president just has to open the football, uh, pick up the telephone, call the war room in the Pentagon where there would be a junior officer and order the attack. Uh, he has the option of consulting with senior military officials, uh, but doesn't have to. So, so that's point one. Point two is even if he does consult with military officials, you know, there's the scenario where the president is is considering a nuclear first strike out of the blue on a nice sunny day, where they have hours to sit around and talk about it. That's highly unlikely. Um, what's more likely is that is that is that there's a there's an alarm of some kind, and so the president is trying to decide what to do in a very time constrained crisis situation. Very unlikely that a, a senior military leader is going to question a legal presidential order. Uh, in a situation where they might think that nuclear weapons are on the way over, uh, and, and remember again, I mean, you know, um, military officials are, are trained to follow orders. They're not. Uh, they're not, their their instinct is not to is not to question these things. So for both of those reasons, I don't think we can. Um, we certainly can't bet on the military uh, stopping an order once given, and you certainly can't. Uh, you can't base our security policy. Um, on a hope that is uh, a very slim hope. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And as you say, there, there's two factors here. One is the idea of the president ringing this relatively low down junior guy and saying, you know, we're under attack, launch the missiles. And th this guy is supposed to say, no, I'm not going to do that, sir. It, it doesn't seem like the sort of thing that you want to depend on happening. Um, particularly when, as you say, and as you point out in your book, and as we'll discuss lately, this, this isn't necessary at all for this to be the way that our nuclear policy, or at least the US nuclear policy is configured. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the process of, of writing the book before we get onto its contents, because it's this really interesting collaboration you have where you've uh, written the book with former Secretary Perry. Um, so I want to ask about a couple of things. The first is how you came to know him and decided to write the book together. And the second thing is, do you think his experiences in sort of the room where it happens, I suppose, uh, to quote Hamilton, um, when it comes to nuclear decisions have, have led to his desire to see a world that is safer from nuclear weapons uh, than it is today? My first experience with Bill Perry was when he was Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration. I was at that time uh, at a great organization called the Union of Concerned Scientists working to end U.S. nuclear testing, uh, which I'm happy to say um, we haven't done since 1992. Um, and he was Secretary of Defense. And so we were pushing for a nuclear test ban treaty to be supported by the Clinton administration. Uh, very heated debate. A lot of people on the wrong side of that debate. Uh, Bill Perry was on the right side of that debate. So I, I earned some early respect for him. Uh, he then left government, and for some and some years later, um, when I was at the Plowshares Fund, where I now am, 
started working with him uh, on um, other issues and and collaborated with him on a uh, on a report where he wrote an article um, on the need to uh, phase out our land based ballistic missiles. And, and then that became uh, more of an ongoing relationship where we both shared um, that goal and saw the danger of, uh, of rebuilding our arsenal of land-based ballistic missiles and started working together towards that goal. Um, I would organize visits for uh, Secretary Perry to Capitol Hill to meet with members of Congress, for example, uh, or organize press conferences where he would speak. And then that eventually evolved into writing joint op-eds um, on the issues that we both cared about. And then about, and, and so, you know, we started working together more and more. And then about two, well, I guess over two years ago, um, we struck on the idea of, you know, look, it's going to be in two years, it's going to be the 75th anniversary of the bomb, uh, which is a big deal. It's going to be the 50th anniversary of the nonproliferation treaty. And it's going to be right before uh, a major presidential election that will determine uh, the future of U.S. nuclear policy. Uh, this would be a great time to do something different, uh, something um, out of the box. And a book seemed to fit the bill. In other words, you know, people pay more attention to a book than they do to an article. So this is something we could do um, to kind of shake things up and get bring more attention to the issues. Um, I was excited about it because I had never written a book, so it was a new a new thing for me to do. Um, the opportunity doing it with Secretary Perry was was really thrilling. He's someone that I have great respect and admiration for, and I think from his perspective, uh, he also wanted to. You know, he's he's in his nineties; he's getting older, uh, but he I think he felt he had one more book in him. Uh, I think it was, um, you know, probably attractive that that someone uh, younger with maybe a little more, more energy would would spend some time doing a bunch of the writing. Uh, and I think he was he was looking to um, write a book that was more for public consumption rather than expert consumption. And and I and certainly that was the direction I wanted to take. And I've spent my career trying to explain these issues um, in simpler terms. Um, to people that haven't spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. Uh, and I think we we managed to do that. Uh, I think we've written a book that that anyone can read, hopefully. Uh, it isn't just for the experts, um, but for people that care about these issues. And, and so, you know, having, uh, uh, you know, maybe my ability to write in a simpler prose, but, but still bring the credibility of Bill Perry along with it, um, I think, to me, turned out to be a a, a very um, powerful combination. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, I, th I think it's a fantastic book. It's the kind of thing where you know I'm I'm reading it, I'm listening to the audio book, and I'm uh, interrupting meals with my family, saying stuff like, you know, have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, did you know that um, in <laughs> 1971 such and such a thing happened? And you know, it, it's it's a really fascinating thing. And I, I the the recommendations that are made in it as well, I think, um, which we'll come on to, I think are. Are very useful because people, you know, there's there's a sense sometimes that we can talk about these problems and we illustrate the uh, the problem and then we don't focus enough on the solutions. So all we do is get people sort of scared and nervous about the propensity for some nuclear war without coming up with with practical things that people can push for and advocate for if if they're concerned about this, if they think that it's a problem. So we'll come on to that in a little moment. Um, one thing I do want to ask about is you, we've talked about the false alarm as the probably the most likely threat. Uh, for an accidental nuclear war to happen. Um, listeners to this show will remember that we have discussed the uh, Arkhipov and Petrov incidents in, in Russia on our episodes on nuclear war before, these near misses that brought us close to calamity. So I sort of wanted to ask you, do you have a favourite nuclear mishap or, or near miss? Because these stories, they get traded around in, in different circles and uh, they're sort of anecdotes that, that go down in history. And there's some pretty wild things that have happened over the years. I mean, do you have a a sort of illustrative story of the kind of false alarm that we're talking about. Yeah, and it's 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 probably the one that Bill Perry was most closely associated with because I've 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 heard it a number of times. But it was in it was in 1980 um, when Bill Perry was actually in the Carter administration uh, in the Pentagon, um, and there was um, there was an alarm of some 200. Uh, nuclear weapons coming from Russia towards the United States. Uh, this was early in the morning or the middle of the night, depending on how you count it. Uh, 
and the warning was was um, sent to uh, the national security advisor, uh, it's a big new Brzezinski, and he had just minutes um, to decide whether to call the president of the United States to wake up the president of the United States and ask him what to do. Um, and Brzezinski um, retells this story in in, uh, in various places. And it, it's chilling because he sits there deciding what to do. And he's in, in bed. Uh, his, his wife is there asleep. And he basically decides that he's not going to wake his wife. Um, that that they have you know maybe half an hour left to live because he's convinced that this is a, a a Soviet nuclear strike and that the United States should respond to it, notably before we know whether it's real or not. Um, and he decides that it's better to let her um, you know die in her sleep rather than wake her up. And so he gets ready to call the president uh, with the warning, and then another call comes in from military aid that says, oh, 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 don't worry about it. It's a false alarm. So so we were within minutes of the National Security Advisor calling the president and saying, Mr. President, um, we have a, a crisis situation with hundreds of nuclear weapons on their way in um, from Russia, very similar to the, um, the preface that we have in the book. Um, so again, a real situation uh, that happened. And, um, and, and what should we do? Now, luckily, that call was never placed because the National Security Advisor was told it was a false alarm. But had it been placed, uh, President Carter would have had just minutes, just minutes to decide what to do. Do you launch your vulnerable land-based missiles um, so that they can't be destroyed by the attack? Or do you leave them there um, and let them be destroyed? I mean, this is, this is the classic uh, nuclear conundrum. That is simply not necessary because there's a real possibility that the president would have felt um, the need to save those ICBMs and launch them. And in this case, it would have turned out to be a false alarm, and the United States would have launched, would have, would have initiated nuclear war, uh, leading to the deaths of you know tens, hundreds of millions of people uh, by mistake, just because we had bad policy. Um, so th- this is one of those teachable, uh, illustrative moments where we have to say, why? Why do we? And and we're still all of those policies are still in place. It hasn't changed hardly at all. You know, you would think that at the end of the Cold War, that would have been our time to say, okay, you know, maybe during the Cold War we needed to take these risks um, because we thought there was a real chance of a of a Russian surprise attack. But that's certainly not possible today. So let's back off from the nuclear brink here. But that didn't happen. And and to me, it didn't happen because politicians, uh, many of whom since then, presidents, for example, understand the insanity of these policies. But because the public attention has gone away, they're not willing to spend the political capital and take the political risks that are necessary uh, without the public support behind them. So we're in the situation where we've had a few presidents, uh, for example, President Obama, I think understood this problem very well, uh, made some significant steps towards addressing them, but then kind of ran out of political steam and didn't feel he had enough political backing uh, to win the battles within Congress and even win his own bureaucracy, uh, his own appointees. And so he left a lot of those to do things um, uh, on the table and and didn't take them up. So unless we build more support, uh, more engagement from the public, I think it'll be difficult, even if, for example, Vice President Biden wins the election in November, who I think is very well predisposed on these issues, it'll be very difficult for him to make the changes that need to be made without public engagement. And it's certainly not been on his agenda. You know, this hasn't been a question that has come up at the debates. Um, it's not something that is discussed very often in political life. Um, I mean, when it, when it comes to these these false alarm stories, the thing that I always think is we're, we're rolling the dice all the time and we don't really realise it because no one sees what's happening and it only comes out through these anecdotes, like like the chilling one that you recounted about the Carter administration. And, you know, we, we have teachable examples of where this has happened just now, we're living through one. You know, in 2003, the first 
coronavirus crossed over into humans. That was SARS. In 2011, MERS crossed over into humans. And again, this was something where you have these events that are happening every so often, every few years, some kind of uh, event happens. And eventually, you know, we were just going to get unlucky and have a virus that had the potential to go pandemic and was much harder to contain. And that is indeed what we all know that we're living through now. And it seems to me, as, as, as you would say, exactly the same thing is happening with these false alarms. They're, they're going to happen every so often. And eventually we will roll snake eyes and get unlucky on one of these. And, you know, it, it may not be stopped in time. And it seems like, like a level of insanity that we have policies that sort of allow this to be a riskier situation than it needs to be. I mean, would you would you agree with that, that we're sort of rolling the dice here? I, I would completely agree. And then the question, as you say, is how many times can you roll the dice and expect to keep getting lucky? I mean, look, we just had the situation where President Trump was in the hospital uh, with COVID on heavy meds. Had there been a false alarm, uh, an alarm, while President Trump was in the hospital, he would have had to make that call. And you know, people don't. People send, tend to wave it away and say, "Oh, what are the chances um, that that'll happen while the president's decision making capacity uh, is, um, you know, is reduced?" Well, it can happen. It's one of those things that is uh, is low probability, not likely to happen. But if it does, the consequences are astronomical. So when you have a situation with low probability, high consequence, you have to take it. Seriously, particularly when there's no reason for these policies to continue. And this is the most frustrating part about this issue is that we're taking these risks for no good reason. We don't need the president to make this decision quickly. There are no significant checks or balances on the president's authority. And we're putting ourselves and the world at risk uh, for no good reason other than nobody w- is willing to take the heat for changing the policy. So in, in recent years, um, and you dis- recount this in the book, nuclear disarmament, which was once some level of bipartisan issue, uh, appears to be succumbing to the sort of partisanship that's eaten up virtually everything else in American public life. Mm. Um, it comes up in your book in 1999, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which would have banned all nuclear tests entirely, was not ratified by the Senate. There was a one of these 51-48 votes To me, it sometimes seems like a bit of a paradoxical issue, because you might think that the increased partisanship of our times could actually, weirdly, make this more possible for us to agree that the president shouldn't have that much power. I mean, to put it crudely, whoever the president is, some massive fraction of the public probably doesn't trust them with nuclear weapons, you know? And of course, more broadly, regardless of your political views, I'm sure that I would agree with everyone from the most rabid lefty to the most raving right-wing person that we don't want to die in nuclear hellfire for no good reason. I mean, do you think that paradoxically, this extreme polarization might actually help a president who is willing to limit their own first strike power? And when it comes to the issue of partisanship, I mean, could could you could you speak to that and how that has influenced uh, these decision makings and, and whether you see any hope for it to be resolved? Sure. I mean, it's a great question. You know, I mean, these issues should not be political. And back in the day, they were much less political than they are now. I mean, look, it was it was Republican presidents that first got us on the road to arms control and reductions, right? It was President Nixon uh, that started us with uh, with the SALT treaties. Uh, Johnson, who was a Democrat uh, for the NPT. Reagan, who started us off on the INF uh, start process that was then finished by, by President Bush. Uh, and then, of course, um, President Obama, who negotiated the New START treaty um, that is that is uh, in danger of expiring right now. Um, so there's there's a bipartisan history here. What what's happened more lately is that the Republican Party has abandoned arms control, and we saw this um, as you mentioned on the test ban treaty. Uh, where it was really framed um, as a as a very partisan issue, and and of course, you know the context of this was was very unfortunate, where the vote happened uh, soon after the vote to impeach President Clinton. Um, so a very par- partisan time in Congress. Obviously, um, the Republican senators felt that um, they missed their chance to impeach President Clinton and retaliated against him by voting down um, the test ban treaty. But that was one of the first times, I think, where you saw um, a a very important national security issue 
um, fall for for clearly political partisan reasons. And we're seeing that happening over and over again. So just in 2010, uh, when the Obama administration brought the New START treaty for Senate ratification, I mean, this this should have been a no-brainer. This was this was clearly in the bipartisan tradition of uh, the START treaty negotiated by Reagan and Bush. Um, this was a continuation of that process, and yet there was strong Republican opposition to the treaty, and frankly, it it barely passed. Uh, but it it passed only with the promise. Uh, that the United States rebuild its nuclear arsenal, uh, those weapons that were left after the treaty reductions, uh, and that plan has now resulted in a uh, in a, in, a, in a you know exhaustive, um, exaggerated, bloated program to spend about two trillion dollars over the next few decades to rebuild the nuclear the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Um, and, and now ultimately we're seeing the Trump administration taking it to an extreme where the Trump administration withdrew from the INF treaty, a Republican treaty, uh, and is, um, is refusing to extend, uh, unconditionally the new start treaty, even though that uh, an Obama treaty, but of course, one that comes out of a long bipartisan tradition. So, uh, you know, I don't see the the you know extreme partisanship uh, as a good thing because ultimately these are issues that are uh, arms control and um, and and ways to reduce nuclear dangers are things that both parties should support uh, and the danger of having it be so partisan is that you'll get one one administration does one thing and then the next administration tears it down. And that's pretty much where we are, right? Where the Obama administration uh, negotiated the um, uh, the New Start Treaty, uh, the Obama administration neg- negotiated the nuclear deal with Iran. Trump administration comes in, uh, first thing it does practically is tear down, step out of the Iran nuclear deal, and now refuses to extend the New Start Treaty. You know, none of these things make any sense. Um, this is just politics, and uh, and I hope that we can get out of this dynamic and get back to a more um, bipartisan uh, sanity position that says reducing nuclear weapons and nuclear dangers is good. And you know, it's interesting. I mean, if I was ever going to say anything nice about President Trump, I would probably say that I think his instinct when it comes to foreign policy is quite isolationist. He doesn't actually want to get that involved in these foreign wars and yet it seems like it was the the undoing of the like that that sort of sits uh askance with the undoing of the iran nuclear deal and all this sort of thing but but one thing i would like to ask about on that subject is i mean you've spent much of your career in washington you've just had discussions with politicians senators congressmen all sorts of things but when, when you bring up these issues how do they react is it a case for them of just saying oh well you know I, I see what you mean, but it's not going to win me any votes or, you know, what, what, what sort of thing, um, what sort of response do you get when it comes to these disarmament issues in, in politics at the moment? Um, it's a really hard time because uh, Democrats very much want to talk about these issues and want to work on these issues. And Republicans, by and large, don't want to talk about these issues at all because the White House doesn't support them. In other words, R- Republicans in Congress tend to follow the White House's lead. Uh, if mm-hmm. the White House is their party, um, and so if if the White House doesn't want to uh, focus on New Start extension, then generally uh, Republicans in Congress don't either. Uh, the only place I've seen um, even a, even a small change in that uh, were situations where there was a real concern that President Trump would go to war with Iran, for example. Um, after, uh, you know, earlier this year, I mean, it's amazing that it was this year. It seems so long ago, but after the United States, after the Trump administration struck, uh, assassinated general Soleimani, um, the, um, you know, highest ranking Iranian general there was, and, and of course then, then Iran, um, retaliated, uh, uh, thankfully in a, in a restrained way against us forces in Iraq. 
there was real concern that that was going to um, escalate into into war. And so Congress um, passed legislation that was uh, vetoed by President Trump, but passed legislation to to limit uh, the ability of of President Trump to go to war with Iran in that situation, and and that did attract Republican votes enough to uh, to win majorities in Congress, but not enough to um, prevent a presidential veto. So when it comes to issues of war and peace, we're, we're able to find um, some Republican support for these things, but. On on less high profile issues like the INF Treaty or the New Start Treaty, uh, things have been pretty much party line, uh, which means that until there's a change in in national uh, leadership, these issues are going to stay stuck. And do you think it's really going to take a, a president to come and push for this and say, "I am limiting my own power"? Um, for, for this to actually get through the Congress as well. I mean, whether they have unified control of the Congress and and the presidency um, aside. Do you think that's what it will take for this to actually uh, come through as a priority? I do, because I don't think Congress um, will ever have the commonality of you to figure this out or to agree. I mean, this is, you know, Congress has too many people, uh, too many different ideas, and and nuclear policy is traditionally uh, the president's business, right? I mean, you know, the presidents have sole authority. These are the president's weapons. Uh, the president has a huge amount of um, executive authority and latitude when it comes to nuclear policy. So with with very few exceptions, all the major changes in, nu- in nuclear policy have been led by the White House, and they, they may get validated um, by Congress, but, but generally um, the White House is in the lead. And so in this case, uh, I would hope that a future president looking back at the experience of the Trump administration and other administrations, uh, would say that presidential sole authority is simply too dangerous. Um, you know, no president's going to say, I'm the danger. But the president would say, look, if we've had, if we've elected problematic presidents in the past who we don't trust with this authority, that means we can elect them again. Uh, we can't trust elections to safeguard us to be the only check and balance on this system. We have to change the policy. And so some enlightened president is going to have to stand up and say, I don't want another president in the future to be elected and have this authority and to take this risk on behalf of the entire country and the world. So I'm going to step forward and make the change. And there's two different ways they can do this. One, they could say, um, I will share nuclear launch authority with Congress or some subset of Congress. And there's actually legislation in Congress to try to make this happen where the president could not order the first use of nuclear weapons uh, unless Congress had declared war and specifically um, the use of nuclear weapons in that war. So in that case, you would have a shared authority. It would be both be the executive and the legislative branch that had to approve the first use of nuclear weapons. That would be useful. That would be helpful. The simpler way would be for the president just declare that it's U.S. policy that the United States will never use nuclear weapons first, uh, a straightforward no first use pronouncement, because what we're worried about is that the president uses nuclear weapons first, um, that you, they use their sole authority for first use. Um, that is that is the primary concern. You know, If we're actually in nuclear war, Having sole authority makes some sense because when you're actually in a shooting nuclear conflict, the last thing you want to try to do is round up 20 members of Congress or whatever it may be um, because it would just be pure chaos. So once you're in nuclear war, it it makes sense to sort of shorten um, any decision-making process to make it as efficient as possible. But in peacetime, uh, when you're not in a shooting war, there's no reason, again, there's no rush. There's no reason why you can't extend that decision-making authority uh, to many more people than we have it um, today. Uh, so those would be the, you know, so either um, sharing the first use decision with Congress or simply prohibiting first use is the way to go. I would just add that the um, Vice President Biden has his own take on this, which is that Biden has called for 
uh, a sole purpose declaration. And these terms get confusing. But what he's saying is that he would like the sole purpose of US nuclear weapons to be to deter their use by others. I read this as uh, the same as a no first use pronouncement. In other words, if your nuclear weapons are just to deter their use by others, you wouldn't use them first because uh, that wouldn't be deterrence. That would be first use warfighting. Um, but, but interestingly, um, when, when, when we press um, the Biden team, they don't go for the no first use terminology. They go for the sole purpose terminology, which I think they think is um, uh, easier for them to uh, finesse. Uh, it's harder to, to be pinned down on exactly what sole purpose means. Uh, and, and I think they're, they're worried about um, you know, maybe being attacked for a no first use policy before the election. Uh, but to me, uh, Biden's uh, initial words in support of sole purpose are, are, are a promising indicator of where he might go as president. <laughs> and I should say, you know, if a Republican president was saying the same things, I'd be the first to line up and say, well done, that's a good policy. Right. Um, I, I think in the book, so you make these 10 key practical recommendations, solutions to aim and campaign for, because th this is short of abolishing nuclear weapons or unilateral disarmament. This isn't what we're talking about here. Um, we've talked about some of these already, but I'm just going to list them quickly and then maybe we can discuss some of them in more detail. So these 10 recommendations you come up with, end presidential sole launch authority, no more nuclear football, prohibit the launch on warning, prohibit first use, which we've just discussed, uh, retiring ICBMs and scaling back the amount of nuclear weapons that we have, um, saving the New START treaty and going further on that, uh, limiting strategic missile defences, uh, you also suggest that it's important to not wait for international treaties to to work out, um, to engage diplomatically with North Korea and Iran, which are seen as some of the biggest threats for nuclear war, um, to, to bring the issue of nuclear weapons into the, the mass movement that's going on at the moment in the States. And of course, also to elect a president who is committed to uh, taking this political action that, that we've said is, is necessary here. So I think uh, just, to, just to unpack some of these... Um, Launch on warning uh, and first use. This is essentially political declarations, aren't they? That that the policy, the nuclear weapons policy at the moment is allows for the first use of nuclear weapons and allows for nuclear weapons to be launched on a warning without evidence of an actual strike. So could this just be changed at the stroke of a pen if people wanted to? Yes, it really could. You know, which is why I said we could solve a lot of these problems um, in a day if we had the political will. To do it, I mean, the president could say uh, today or tomorrow that we will not use nuclear weapons first. Um, that, but of course, the devil's in the details because you know some people would say, well, if you're using a new, if you're using nuclear weapons in response to an alert, you're not really using them first, right? But until you know that that attack is real, in my opinion, you are. So that's why we put this additional. Uh, policy in the book, which is that you should not launch nuclear weapons on warning of attack. Because if you're launching on warning of attack, it may be a false alarm, as we've discussed, and you may be, in fact, using nuclear weapons first and starting nuclear war. So in addition to no first use, we should clarify that we will not launch nuclear weapons on warning of attack. And then we go even further than that to say, if we have a policy of no first use, and not launching nuclear weapons on warning of attack, we should get rid of the nuclear weapons that we're most likely to use first. And this is the land-based ICBMs, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. They are, uh, there are 400, uh, 450 silos out spread across the upper Midwest of the United States. Uh, the Russians and everyone else knows exactly where these weapons are. You can find them on Google Maps. Uh, they're sitting ducks in, in any attack. Um, and, and so if we're not going to use nuclear weapons first, or we're not going to launch them on warning, uh, then these weapons would all be destroyed. In, th these are not retaliation weapons, right? Because in a retaliation, these weapons would be destroyed. Uh, our retaliation weapons are deployed at sea or, or weapons that could be launched on, on uh, bombers before an attack arrived. So if your position is we won't launch first, only second, then it makes there's no point in having first use weapons because they would all be destroyed in the ground 
um, by the time you got there. This is a great time to have that conversation because the United States is, is uh, the, the Air Force is signing contracts with uh, Northrop Grumman to build a new generation of ICBMs. Uh, it's going to cost amazingly over $250 billion over the next few decades to build and sustain and maintain uh, these new weapons. So we say, you know, this is crazy. I mean, these weapons um, are tremendously expensive and they're tremendously dangerous. Uh, they're an attractive nuisance because they're the weapons that create this false alarm danger of use them or lose them. Uh, they're a catastrophe waiting to happen. They're, they're kind of a, an extra insurance policy, right? Because you know, the, the main weapons that guarantee our deterrence against attack are the submarine weapons. They're the ones that are going to survive a nuclear attack so we can retaliate with those weapons. The insurance policy to that, um, well, one insurance policy is that we have 14 of these submarines. So if something goes wrong with one, there's 13 more. So that's one insurance policy. Uh, the other insurance policy is that we still have nuclear weapons on bombers that can be scrambled and sent aloft before an attack. And the ICBMs are yet another insurance policy, um, but but they're not worth it um, because they create this false alarm danger. So so getting retiring the ICBMs and and not spending that two hundred fifty billion dollars uh, strikes us as a particularly good idea, particularly when the United States has so many more important needs uh, to do with its money. Right? I mean, we could uh, you know the next president is going to be facing the coronavirus. Rebuilding the economy, uh, addressing climate change, uh, addressing racial injustice, um, having a lot of money to solve those problems would really help. And it'll probably cost way more than two hundred fifty billion dollars, but that's a good down payment um, to that direction. And and you know maybe I'll I'll end by just talking about the importance of um, of electing a president that understands these issues, but also that these issues be part of the mass movement, um, because it is it isn't enough to elect a, uh, an educated president. I mean, we had President Barack Obama, who I said was really good on these issues. Uh, I think what happened is that when people saw Obama get elected, they said, "Okay, well, he's got the nuclear thing. Um, let's go focus on some other things that that we need to push him on." Um, but but he didn't. You know, he couldn't convince his bureaucracy. He couldn't convince Congress to go with a number of his ideas. Um, and he didn't feel that he had enough political support in the public to give him the political capital that he would need to spend to get these things done. Uh, so let's not mistake make that mistake again. If, uh, uh, if a president comes along who understands these issues, um, we can't just leave them to it. Uh, nuclear weapons has to become part of the mass movement of issues along with uh, racial justice, climate change, women's rights, all these issues, because um, nuclear policy is, you know, in many ways, it's the first issue, right? Because we don't get this right. Um, we won't be around to solve all the other ones. And in another way, nuclear policy has money to give to these issues, you know, um, climate change, um, uh, you know, the coronavirus, they all need more resources. Uh, for my opinion, in the nuclear policy sphere, we, we have too many resources. Uh, we've got resources coming around of our ears to pay for this $2 trillion <laughs> uh, nuclear rebuild, much of which is simply not needed. So if these different sectors got together, uh, we could build support for taking the money out of the nuclear program, giving it to climate change, giving it to racial justice, uh, giving it to fighting the pandemic. And I think we'd all be much, much better off. Yes, and, and I completely agree with you there. The the limiting of strategic missile defenses, and I just I think it's very important to say why would we want to limit strategic missile defenses? Why does it actually make us safer if we don't have strategic missile defenses in place? You know, it used to be that it was understood um, that if you put up defenses, the response of your adversary will to be will be to build more offenses. Uh, it, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of the way these things have always worked. You know, when you think about um, castles and building higher walls, and the response was always um, more powerful catapults. 
So the defense never has the upper hand. Uh, the offense always does. And that's why President Nixon negotiated the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty back in 1972 that limited defenses because they understood that the only way to reduce offenses is to limit defenses. Well, President Reagan came along and he changed all that by promoting his Star Wars missile defense system, uh, which never worked. And the systems that we have today, frankly, uh, don't work effectively enough for any president to uh, depend upon them for reasons that I won't go into. So, so the only real purpose of these defenses has been to create a political floor below which the Russians won't reduce their weapons. Because the Russians say, well, we don't think your defenses are going to work either, but we can't guarantee it. So let's build, let's, let's assume that they'll work. We'll build that into our planning. Uh, and we simply won't reduce our weapons below a certain level um, on, the, on the off chance that your defenses work. So having defenses as, as good as they sound politically, and of course, no politician wants to say, I won't defend America. So that's why we are where we are. Uh, mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that th those defenses make it much harder to reduce offensive nuclear weapons. Yeah, they just throw off people's nuclear calculus when it comes to the mutually assured destruction. They probably don't work to actually keep anyone safer, as far as we know, with, with actual analysis of the technology. And in addition to that, they mean that people have to build more ICBMs, which more ICBMs means more risk. I mean, one thing that does come to mind here is to say that, uh, I, I can't remember the exact number, but the US and Russia both have thousands of nuclear weapons uh, each. And other countries, China, Britain, that have nuclear weapons... Um, only have a much, much smaller number, which is effective as a deterrent, but reduces the risk. Because obviously, the more of these weapons you have, the more chances there are of accidents, alarms, and so on that, that could happen, or exactly even right. the theft or loss of nuclear weapons, which has occurred in the past. Um, so if people have listened to this and they want to get involved to help in the cause, to make the world safer from nuclear weapons, aside from buying the book, of course, what, what else would you sort of recommend for them to, to read and do and find out? Uh, yes, great question. Well, you can certainly um, go to the plowshares.org website, uh, spell the British way, British way, plowshares. Um, and, and you can see all the work that we're doing. Uh, you know, plowshares is a foundation. We raise money uh, from people and give it to the best projects with the best people and the best ideas. Um, so we're, we're constantly looking for uh, supporters and we're constantly looking for great ideas to to invest in. So if you have either one of those, um, give us a call. Uh, you can check out uh, Bill Perry's website, uh, the William J. Perry Project, uh, who is, always has great resources up and is doing great things. And you should check out uh, podcasts, both of Plowshares and of the Perry Project. The Perry Project Plowshares is called uh, Back from the Brink, I believe it is, or At the Brink. I'm not sure which. Um, and then there are the groups that Plowshares funds to get this work done. And there, and there are many, many of them, whether it be the Arms Control Association or Beyond the Bomb or Friends Committee on National Legislation or Women's Action uh, for New Directions. These are all groups that have a lot of great information on their websites. Um, and you can get educated and get smart on the issues there. Um, and then lastly, uh, if you live in the United States, but, but even if you don't, you know, talk to your public officials, um, make sure that they know that you care about these issues because unless public officials hear from their constituents, uh, they will simply not pay attention, um, to the policies that we, we need them to support. Your book, The Button, The New Nuclear Arms Race and Presidential Power from Truman to Trump is available, all good bookstores, etc., etc. Tom Kalina, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and coming on the show to talk about this really important issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thanks again to Tom Kalina for taking time out of his day to be interviewed for the show. Now, I just want to finish briefly before we do all of our final plugs and housekeeping with a quote from Secretary Perry, which he quoted in this Reddit, Ask Me Anything, that we referred to. We'll link to it in the show notes. Now, one user, when they found out that there really might not be all that much between us and accidental nuclear war, he, he seemed very depressed and he said, so all it really takes is for one mistake or bad lapse of judgment and the president will send out nukes and we all die and that's it? I'm having an existential crisis, was the general sort of attitude. And Bill Perry's response, I thought, summarised how I think we should all feel about this, and the aims that he and Tom are trying to get across with the book, so I'll quote it in full. He said, quote, 
It can be easy to feel overwhelmed with the horrible reality of nuclear weapons, but the truth is that there are many things we can do to lower the danger. In the United States, we can retire the football and declare a no-first-use policy, reducing the danger for a president launching an unprovoked nuclear attack. There has been legislation put forth to this effect, but it needs public support to pass. We can prohibit launch on warning, which calls for launching on the warning of an attack before it has landed. This policy is dangerous because it is possible, in fact very likely, that a warning is false, such as the case of a mechanical error or cyber attack. There have been several false alarms in the past. We can retire our land-based ICBMs, which are in known fixed locations, and place pressure on the president to make a decision within 5-10 to 10 minutes on whether to launch on warning before an attack would destroy them in their silos. Our air and sea legs of the triad are more than sufficient for deterrence. Right now we are preparing to spend over $100 billion to rebuild our ICBM force, but it has not happened yet. If we act now, we can halt this plan. We can push for our leaders to re-engage with long-standing arms control agreements, such as New START, and reinforce the strength of international nuclear norms. Most of all, what you yourself can do is to demand that nuclear weapons are once again addressed by your politicians as a serious issue, to educate yourself and to initiate conversations within your community, and to make sure this issue is brought to the forefront. Progress has been made in the past to lower the danger, and there was a time after the Cold War when I, Bill Perry, believed that the danger had passed but we allowed ourselves to become complacent and forget what was at stake. Change will not come about until there is significant public pressure once again to demand accountability on these destructive weapons." End quote. So that's a good message to leave on. And again, if you're interested in this, there are plenty of things you can do. Plowshares has their own podcast on nuclear issues, Press the Button, which Tom now co-hosts. And uh, Bill Perry has his own podcast too, At the Brink, that discusses incidents from nuclear history and nuclear policy in more detail. And you can, of course, obtain the book The Button. There's also a great audiobook, which I can personally say is well done. There's so much fascinating nuclear history and details of policy in there that we didn't really have time to get into in this interview, so it's well worth your while to pick that book up. And you can follow Tom Kalina on Twitter, at Tom Kalina, and Bill Perry is there too, as at SecDefense19, or SecDef19. And you can get involved with the Plowshares Foundation as well on social, of course. There are plenty of ways to stay engaged with these issues, but ultimately I just think it's a question of demanding the simple changes that we need to take place to make us all safer. You know, there's a tiny minority of people who benefit from having these weapons, and frankly, for the rest of us, you know, we don't need ICBMs, we don't need First Strike Authority, and we don't need Launch on Warning. All they do is make us less safe. The world would be vastly better off without these things, and you could still easily have a nuclear deterrent that would be capable of retaliation. So the point I would make is that there's plenty of things you can do short of full abolition of nuclear weapons that do make us much, much safer. If you enjoy what you've heard today, please consider donating to the show. You can do so online at physicspodcast.com. You'll find our PayPal and our Patreon. The Patreon will allow you to subscribe and get access to bonus episodes and early releases of episodes that are going to come out in the future, including the end of the SoftBank series that we're halfway through at the moment and lots of episodes about climate change, as well as some bonus episodes that will only ever be released there, such as our book club episodes. You can, of course, contact us via the same contact form on the website that we always talk about, physicspodcast.com, that's the website, and you can find the contact form there, that goes through to my email. If there's someone you want me to interview, if you're interested in discussing different topics, if there's something that you'd like us to cover, please don't hesitate to let me know. Go there, we can talk about it. And of course, if you have any feedback, any comments on the show, anything that you've heard today, please let me know. I think it's it's always great to get feedback from people, and I always enjoy it, and I do try and respond to every email that I get. You can, of course, follow us on Twitter, at PhysicsPod, and we're on Facebook, Physical Attraction. Of course, the best thing you can do for the show, if you don't want to donate or send me emails or anything like that, is to tell other people who might be interested in, say, global thermonuclear Armageddon, all about the show, and I tell them to give it a listen, uh, leave ratings and reviews, blah, 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 blah. You know the story by now. Until next time, then, providing we're not all vaporised, please do take care. I always like to end on a positive note, so here is a rousing, uplifting song which is guaranteed to cheer you up. funeral it is sad to think that sooner or later those you love will do the same for you and you may have thought it tragic not to mention other adjectives to think of all the weeping they will do 
but don't you worry. No more ashes, no more sackcloth, and an armband made of black cloth will someday never more adorn a sleeve. For if the bomb that drops on you gets your friends and neighbors too, there'll be nobody left behind to grieve. And we will all go together when we go. What a comforting fact that is to know. Universal bereavement, an inspiring achievement. Yes, we all will go together when we go. We will all go together when we go. All suffused with an incandescent glow. No one will have the endurance to collect on his insurance. Lloyds of London will be loaded when they go. We will all fry together when we fry. We'll be French fried potatoes by and by. There will be no more misery when the world is our rotisserie. Yes, we all will fry together when we fry. We will all bake together when we bake. There'll be nobody present at the wake. With complete participation in that grand incineration, nearly three billion hunks of well done steak. We will all char together when we char. And let there be no moaning of the bar. Just sing out a tedium when you see that ICBM, and the party will be come as you are. We will all burn together when we burn. There'll be no need to stand and wait your turn. When it's time for the fallout and St. Peter calls us all out, we'll just drop our agendas and adjourn. We will all go together when we go. Every hot and tot and every Eskimo. When the air becomes uranius, we will all go simultaneous. Yes, we all will go together when we all go together. Yes, we all will go together when we go.